Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Scott Melbourne and I am the director of the Schneider Museum of Art, part of the Oregon Center for the Arts here at SOU. Please note that we have you all on mute and please stay on mute until the end of the talk. If you have any questions, please type those into the chat or save them for the end of the talk. Today I have the pleasure of introducing two special guests. Jill Hartz, the curator of our current exhibition, Collecting Cuba, and participating artist, Elsa Mora. Appointed executive director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon in Eugene in 2008, Jill Hartz retired in December of 2019. She now lives in Ashland, Oregon, where she continues to support the arts and museum fields as a contemporary curator and arts consultant. Prior to Oregon, she served as the director of the University of Virginia Art Museum in Charlottesville and worked in various capacities at the Herbert F. Johnson Museum at um, Museum of Art at Cornell University. Elsa Mora is an artist and curator, a recipient of the UNESCO Ashberg Busaris for Artists. She was born and raised in Cuba and moved to Los Angeles in 2001, where she lived into 2014. Mora currently resides in upstate New York with her family. Elsa's art has been exhibited worldwide in galleries and museums. She taught at the Vocational School of Arts in Kamigi, Cuba, and has been a visiting artist at the Art Institute of Chicago, San Francisco State University, and the Art Institute of Boston, the Museum of Modern Art uh, uh, Design Store, and the National Gallery of Art, among others. Her work is in the permanent collection of the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC, the Long Beach Museum of Art, California, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. Moore has collaborated as an illustrator with such organizations as the Museum of Modern Art, Chronicle Books, the New York Review of Books, Penguin Random House, the Oprah Magazine, Cosmo Cosmopolitan, and Te Noi S, among others. Mora is one of the founding members of Art Yard, a contemporary art center based in Frenchtown, New Jersey, where she is artistic director and curator. Please join me in welcoming Elsa Mora and Jill Hartz. Thank you, Scott. Um, I'll begin. And I just want to begin with a personal story because I was just thinking about this, Elsa. Um, I have known about Elsa's work and been collecting it for the past 20 years since my first trip to Cuba. Um, but we didn't meet at that time. And how we met, I thought was really interesting because one of the um, curators who, with whom I often went to Cuba, Daryl Couturier, had a gallery in Los Angeles and he specialized in Cuban artists. And I was visiting him one day and we were actually looking at one of Elsa's pieces and it was kind of this beautiful butterfly um, creation. And I was saying how much I liked your work. And he said, oh, you know, she lives just around the corner from me um, when you were still in LA. And it's like, oh my gosh, really? I can't believe it. So we actually called you, I think, and I came right over and visited you, which was just so wonderful. So um, our friendship began then, I believe, and has followed you from LA um, to New York. So I'm so glad you're with us today. Um, I thought that what we would do is start with looking at some of the pieces that are in the exhibition itself, because you're in two galleries here and um, the works are from very different periods. So there are three photographs from this series, um, Loss of Reason, which were done in 2000. And those are part of the section that I've titled Identity, the Body Politic. 
And that also includes pieces by Belka Sion, Magdalena Campos Pons, Marcha Maria Bravo, Amy Garcia, and Cyrenaica Morera. And I think they have all in different I mean, some of them influenced others very clearly, but there's a lot to unpack there in terms of identity and especially women and women um, at that point in Cuba. Um, the more recent work, Fading, is from 2018 and was part of the exhibition Paperweight that we did at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art in Eugene. And I know so much has happened in your life and career between these creations, which nearly span um, two decades. So perhaps you, we could start on this chronological path of creation and begin with um, the works in Loss of Reason. Okay, so I have a little um, PowerPoint presentation that I put together for you. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so the pieces that you are going to see, these ones uh, that are part of the exhibition, this is one of them, it's a series. Uh, it's called Perda do Sentido, which is a term in Portuguese that means uh, different things. It means loss of meaning, loss of direction, loss of identity. So that's the general idea about the title. Um, but the main thing that I want to share with you is how I came to create these pieces and what's the story behind them. I originally didn't think that I was going to be showing this work to anybody because it was a very um, intimate, special, thing that I did and it had to do with the death of my dear friend Belki Sayon who is a Cuban artist that worked in the um, media of printmaking especially this type of technique called uh, holographia and when I was living here this is my studio in Havana when I was there in 1999 that was a year before I moved to America. <clears throat> uh, when I was here, I was processing the death of, of, of my friend, which happened in a very sudden way. Nobody was ready for that. We couldn't understand why someone so full of life and talented and amazing had taken her own life. So I had this impulse when I was there, that's the studio where I, I was working. Uh, and the, where, where you see this red arrow, there was a wall right there behind that door. And at the time I had this tiny little digital camera that had the lowest pixels in the world. It was like a like hundred pixels per inch, something like that, like really, really low resolution. And um, I just, I was just so um, mourning my friend and I needed to do something, some type of action that was tangible because thinking about her wasn't enough. So I was going through uh, her work, uh, images that I had and tried to figure out why it happened, what it happened to her. And then I had this kind of, impulsive idea to turn myself into one of her characters. Um, she created these very intriguing characters that are connected to the um, Abaqua um, religion. It's not exactly a religion, it's like a brotherhood and it's inclusive only to men. So we, women were not al are not allowed to be part of it. And you know, her work was around these a subject of secrets and power and identity and all of that. So I just wanted to turn into one of these characters uh, in terms of remembering a conversation that we had where she said that one of the figures that she uses, she used in her work uh, represented a fish, which is a symbol in this uh, fraternity that is to her, it was a symbol of uh, secrecy, the prohibited, 
And also, I remember once she said something like, a fish is something very slippery that you can't completely hold in your hands. It kind of it goes away. It slips from you. And um, that's how I see some parts of life. Like you don't have an explanation for certain things. You are very curious to know the why of everything, but unfortunately not everything has an answer. And that's exactly the way I was feeling at the time. I had seen her a week before we were having a conversation. She had come to visit my apartment uh, right in that space. And we were talking about different things. Uh, I just couldn't imagine, you know, how something could change so dramatically and drastically. Uh, and then that's how this series came to, to exist. I just put a piece of black fabric on the background. I painted my face with some black acrylic uh, in order to, again, to look like one of her figures. And I just needed to capture that. And it was like a conversation with her where somehow by becoming part of her narrative of mystery and secrecy and uh, things that have no answers, I accepted the fact that not everything has an answer. And I somehow kind of uh, let her go, right? Um, I, I found peace with the decision that she had made. And that's how I um, helped myself process this loss that I had at the time. So that, that's the story behind uh, these three pieces. And then uh, I actually took them in 1999, which is the year that she died in September. And then I showed them for the first time the year after. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly under what circumstances, but I decided that it was okay to reveal something that I had done just for me. Um, so that's the story. Uh, Belkis, I, I can share this document with you after we're done here so you can have the links. But she was an extraordinary person, extremely talented, positive. She was very successful as an artist, uh, very smart, uh, actually very happy. She had the biggest laughter in the world. She was very spontaneous. Um, she is a big part of the Cuban culture and the, the art culture there. And she still lives in the memory of so many people. Um, so that's the story behind that piece. Uh, Jill, do you, do you have any questions or anything? Um, well, you mentioned calligraphy. I wonder if you oh, want to yes. talk a little bit. I don't know if you've ever made calligraphs too. Yes, I, I created two of them after her passing because I, I just wanted to experience being her for, for a few seconds. And I did a lot of research about the way she created this work. And I did it myself uh, in Cuba. But then over here, I found a book that I am sharing with you here. I, I have a link and everything if you're interested. It's a technique that not many people are familiar with or have explored enough. So if you're interested, that would be something interesting to do, just to find information and see what an amazing um, type of technique this is. Um, it's very simple, but Belkis took it to the highest level possible. Uh, she used very basic materials from paper, uh, sandpaper, different types of uh, materials that she glue on a board and then you ink all of that and then you press it through the print, uh, the press. And she created these beautiful uh, pieces. Many, the biggest ones, for example, this one, as you can see, is the combination of different uh, parts. So she uh, broke it down in different pieces and then that's how she was able to create very large murals with this. Just, and, and she has a retrospective on view at the Schnitzer that um, Christina Vives um, organized um, and that work is in it. So that shows up through, is on view, I think, through the summer if, and the museum will reopen there, I believe in May. So um, it's definitely worth seeing these pieces in person. They are so powerful. 
Yeah, um, each one has a story. I'm not sure if the stories will be um, added to the show, but um, the stories are amazing. And I highly recommend to anyone watching this to do a little research later. There, there is a lot that you can see on the internet. And I even found um, a video of her. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I put it somewhere here. I'll make sure that it's somewhere where you can see her actually working. There is a little video of her uh, from Cuba when she was there. And the it's fascinating. The show has that too. The show includes that video. Oh, that's wonderful. I think it's very special yeah. to be able to see her at work. Yeah. yeah. So, huh. So, in terms of your own work, um, I, you weren't just making photographs. It seems like you've always explored a lot of different media in your expression. Is that true? Yeah, I have a fascination with materials. So I have these periods of time when I'm curious about one specific material and I try to explore the possibilities of it. And somehow I always end up connecting that material to people, the way we are. Uh, one of the uh, longest periods of researching a material with paper in the last several years, um, it was um, amazing because paper, I mean, a, a piece of paper is just a, a flat thing, it's extremely simple, everybody's familiar with it, but you can manipulate it in so many ways and turn it into so much by just uh, playing with it. And that's how I came to create a whole series of works. Uh, one of those series is included in the, in the show. This is an example of, you know, the type of uh, stuff that I discovered, you know, by working with this material. So yes, in general, that, that's something that I'm very fascinated with, not only paper, but painting, uh, metal, like lately I, I'm discovering the, the amazing expressive power of metal, which is a extremely hard material. But then suddenly I'm finding similarities between metal on paper and the way in which I was working with this soft forgiving material. And then this other one that is tough and stubborn and kind of a little more difficult, but it has all the malleability um, and all of that translates always into my real interest, which is the human mind. That's my, I would call it almost like obsession. I'm very interested in the brain and how it works and why we are the way we are and how we are, are constantly changing. And this comes probably from a history of mental illness in my own family. And I have a son with autism. Um, that is going to be 16 this year. I'm very, very interested in uh, observing him in particular because he's next to me and he's an amazing person. Um, mostly I'm interested in the fact that everybody's unique. You know, there is this book, Jill, I, I haven't told you, but uh, someone just published this book, which is amazing. It's called Nobody's Normal. I should add that to this document. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's actually a very profound study of the uh, history of mental illness and how the idea of mental illness has changed so much throughout the history of humanity. And it's just fascinating. And you know, mm -hmm. that's one of those areas where I ended up becoming very serious because of our son. But that, of course, tr has translated into my my work as an artist and um, <clears throat> as a curator too. So I think it's it would be useful to describe how what we're looking at these very small paper objects, as beautiful and intriguing as they are on their own, are all um, at least metaphorically aligned with um, mental um, disorders at least, yeah. um, right? So they are all tied into whether it's even from insomnia to, I know, bipolar or something like that. So you came up with 101 objects 
that just reflect the real range of what we think of as mental disorders, but are different ways of functioning too in this world. That's right. This series is called 101 Notions. And that's exactly what it is, what Jill was uh, explaining. Every single object represents a mental condition. You can call it mental disorder, you know, anything that you prefer. But I spent about a year doing a lot of research about these 101 conditions that I decided to, to work on. And they are, you know, some of them you're familiar with, some of them you probably um, suffer from. You know, some of my friends identify their own conditions here. And so it's actually a, a very interesting way to connect with people through the exhibition, because once it was there, some people recognized their condition and they came to me and they say, actually, I'm number 13. You know, every piece has a number and a title. And the title is the, the name of the condition. And so it was my attempt to turn something that is so um, complicated, you know, into something beautifully and tangible, uh, beautifully tangible, mm -hmm. which is these 101 objects. Like they represent different types of ways of being. So if they were people, nobody would mind what they are. <laughs> You just look at them and see the variety, the diversity, the, the, the you know, like amazing, um, um, how can I say, like attractive look of them. Uh, but when you don't see things that you don't understand, it's like a big mystery. You know, you can't look inside of people's heads and see what's going on. You know, there is no way to do that. So, and I have this just, um, my biggest wish would be to be in my son's head just for a day <laughs> to see how it feels to be autistic. Um, and because I can't do that, all I can do is just to interpret whatever I observe, you know, through my experience. So that's the story of behind this piece. But this show in general, the whole exhibition was done using only paper and glue. And behind every series, there is a story and there is one of the faculties of the mind, such as memory and things like that. So that's the, the story behind this work. And fading itself, I think, is about consciousness, right? That's it takes right. Area. Yeah, this is fading. It's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces. I mean, six that you see here. And they start with a dark color and then they fade uh and go into a lighter color and um, i wrote a little bit somewhere about the um the explanation for for this piece but it's basically uh the idea of your your uh mind fading from being awake like can you imagine can you believe that we're talking now we're totally awake we can hear we can talk and then suddenly your consciousness is com completely gone when you go to sleep, right? So you are in a constant state of fading from one state into the other. And I find that to be extremely fascinating. And I'm fascinated also by dreams and how in that state of complete not being there, you are already, you're there. You are actually there somehow but in a way that is not um, tangible, you know? Like you just remember in the morning, like, oh, actually I had this dream or I had this nightmare or whatever. And so this is what this piece is about. It's about this um, kind of strange <laughs> way in which we exist, right? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that's the story behind that. Mm -hmm. And there's so many tiny pieces. I mean, I just think of, kind of the patience and the actual production of making these is its own kind of meditative exercise. Um, you must have yeah. endless patience for exploring these forms and working in such a small scale at times. Yeah, the process to me is as important or sometimes even more than the actual result. And that applies even to the photographs that I showed you before. 
about my friend, uh, maybe because of the way in which art came to happen to me, it wasn't a career choice or something I woke up one day, like I might go into art. It was my way to survive really, whatever was going on. And it was my language that I, I, wa I wasn't even that, um, how can I say, interested in naming that art. It was just what I did in my weird little world. You know, whenever I, I was going through something, I used just my imagination. Um, even at this time, you know, it's just my way to go through, to navigate, you know, whatever thing I'm going through. So behind what I do, there is a, a very intentional process of just immersing myself into the creative process. And um, whatever happens, happens. But I, I try not to have a lot of expectations. I just enjoy it. And sometimes I suffer it because I get stuck in an idea and then I don't find the right way to put it out there. And then that becomes a problem itself. That is kind of interesting because then I have to work on it in my mind, you know, not with my hands. And then suddenly I find the solution. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interaction with myself and my own brain. Um, right. it's, I love it. I love it. Right. I, I, even if I don't love it, I don't have an option. I, it's what I do, <laughs> you know? Right. No, I think it makes you um, productive in the world, at least to make right. the world that you live in. Mm -hmm. um, so what's your, let's keep going in your PowerPoint and see what you have next. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, this is something that um, we were talking about creativity that we wanted okay. to talk about. Um, uh, should we go into that? Into yeah, creativity? let's talk about that because it's always good to know, you know, what makes a person creative and where do you get, how do you, you know, you can't just wait for um, the muse to strike sometimes, but. Um, right. Well, in my case, a big part of my creative process is curiosity. You know, I think that that is the biggest drive that I had always since I was very little. And this thing that I'm sharing on the screen right now was actually from an email that I got from a friend that came to visit me the other day, Ellen Berger. She's an amazing human. And we were just talking about ourselves. You know, she's from Los Angeles. I used to live there. We were good friends. And then I'm here now and she's there. So she was visiting. And we were asking each other, you know, what are you doing now? What's, what's, your, what's driving you right now? <laughs> and then she was talking about this concept of the down the rabbit hole that I, I absolutely connected with immediately. And I thought, this is what I've been doing my whole life, which is, you know, there are certain ways to go through life. One is you make a plan, a strategic plan or whatever you call it. And you say, this is what I want. But honestly, I never did that. You know, I had general ideas, you know, like I, I'm dreaming with having a studio one day. You know, that was one idea. Uh, I would like to have children one day. That was an, another idea. But when it comes to art, I try not to take it as a, as a business plan, like I'm going from here to here, it's more like, okay, what uh, do I care about right now at this time? What is the most important thing on the top of my head? And I used to tell this to uh, my students uh, whenever I do workshops, like if you take a little time just to think, you know, what is driving you right now? Whatever that is, suffering, happiness, um, you know, the anticipation of something, follow that intentionally and see where that takes you. So that's what I've done uh, throughout my career in terms of the concept of, you know, whatever body of work I have. And one of the latest um, rabbit holes that I'm going through is resilience, right? Which is what makes you strong, you know, what makes you resilient. Um, this comes from me observing my two children you know, Diego with his autism, he's going through an extremely challenging time right now that I can't even describe over here. That is taking two years of his life, but somehow he just finds a way to turn things around and make his life meaningful for himself. 
he's an artist too. You know, he draws a lot. Um, then my daughter, you know, she's going to college. And of course, the whole thing about COVID and the isolation has, you know, affected a lot of people, especially young people going to school. You know, it's really, really, but I'm just um, in, how can I say, I'm impressed by how they find ways to, to make it, you know, from one day to the other. So, and that's how I ended up uh, working with metal because I thought as a material, you know, it's such a hard material, you know, I want to change it and turn it around and, and make it bend and do this and do that. Um, so that's my latest research is metal resilience and the malleability of things, you know, how, no matter how difficult it is, what you're going through, there is a way always to, to adapt, mm. right? Um, right. I'm, I'm fascinated by this whole idea of survival, malleability, um, resilience. Mm. Um, and, yeah, and that's how I do normally when I go into a body of work, you know, I find something that means a lot to me at the time. And I try to find, not even find answers, but actually ask questions to myself and ask questions to materials. You know, like how, how do you, how are you, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. how are you made of, you know, how can you be changed? And then I act as, as the changing agent, right? With a hammer. So I bought like 25 hammers the other day for different um, uh, ways of working with metal. And it's very empowering because then I have this hammer in my hand, a piece of metal, and I got an anvil that is so heavy, I couldn't even lift that. My husband had to help me. And then I'm working with this. And the last thing I'm thinking about is the metal, really. It's about, I'm thinking about my song. Like every time I <laughs> hammer that thing, it's like, but look, it, it's looking more beautiful now. It has texture, it's changing. So that's how my brain works when I'm creating. You know, I'm connecting the action that I'm doing with something that I care about. And I find the, the dots and connect them. And that's how I get into that rabbit hole. <laughs> Before I know I'm so far away. And I just love getting lost in that process. And then something comes up from that every time. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're doing with metal. That's so interesting and so different. Because I think that after the show at the Schnitzer, you were thinking of going into clay, doing more works in clay too. I don't know if that happened or not. Well, that's a, that's a very interesting thing because life at the end, in my case, tells me where I should go. Mm -hmm. Dependent. So Cole, before I start work, uh, after I had this idea of working with clay, COVID came. Hmm. And then suddenly clay didn't make a lot of sense to me. That's, that's too easy. You know, you just mold it. Uh, I st I'm still going to do it. And I have all these conditions here. But uh, after COVID came, the material that actually came before metal was a fiber, like fabric, um, um, you know, textiles. I did a lot of uh, textile work and fiber work and I realized well I think I'm doing this because it's a soft material it's very friendly mm -hmm. right like that feeling when you lie down your bed you know that <laughs> the towel that that dries your There's skin comfort. You. Yeah. oh my god I thought uh, this is what I have to do now so I had this explosion and I did all this embroidery and all this type of uh, soft work and I thought, this is all I need right now. I, I can't even think about clay or whatever. I just need this soft place. So I did that for, uh, for a while. But then I was like, OK, I think I'm good now. <laughs> I got enough of the softness. Now I'm going to go into the, the other, opposite, you know, the opposite of a soft, right. which is hard. Wow. And then I became totally wow. crazy about it. <laughs> wow. So let's move on through some of the slides because we don't have too much time. That's so right. Questions. Okay. Yeah, this is one more example I wanted to give you about the way I do creativity. This is the backyard in my house. I live in the middle of the countryside. And then, you know, I, I look at 
things that make sense to me. So this little shed, I mean, it was falling apart and I painted it and I turned it into a small gallery. And then I did some work with that, um, with my son, you know, those are flowers that were, you know, we have tons of them in the front of the house. And I did something with my son. Unfortunately, I didn't bring the video with him, but it was actually around a time when um, uh, he was going through a really hard time. And then he, he laid down on top of these flowers and I made a video with music. But it's just one, <clears throat> excuse me, one more example of how I approach creativity. Like it doesn't have to be lineal, it's whatever makes sense. I just go for it and have fun. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, and here, because I know we don't have a lot of time, it's a tiny um, video. It's like 37 seconds of my studio. Um, oh, it's a little great. shaky. Yeah, so I'm sitting right in front of this computer that you see here. So you get an idea. And I have different areas where I do different things. There is a thinking area, the kitchen area, the, the metal area, the drawing. Um, You'll see some of my hammers. There they are. Hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> so this is where, this is my world, is where I do what I do. And um, it's an office too, because I work for, uh, for Art Yard, which is an, an, an art center. And then the last thing that I wanted to share with you um, to also show you another type of thing that I do is a little animation that I did of a poem and why this is special because it's about I, i'll let you read the poem and, and experience this and then you probably will get the idea but this is just one more thing that i do Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you. And that was basically a poem by uh, Aracelis Girmay, which is an amazing poet. And it's about what, what it means to be alive, really. You know, it's about grabbing those little moments that make sense to you and that are special and do something with them. Um, that's what I do as an artist. That's my, my way of doing things. And I can also see some of the images of the um, figures um, that appear in other cutouts that you've done. So there's this connection between the shapes that are so fluid on the screen to what actually you've made. Um, also with words, I think some of those have words that go around them as well. So I can see this connection in another um, material for what that's you're right. doing too. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Huh. No, that's great. Great. Thank Scott you. brought us all back together again, I see. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can ask you, more if, questions, but if you have questions from others, we can start with that. Sure, Jill. Um, yes, if anybody has a question, you may type that into the chat and we can read them aloud. I, I will be happy to do that for, uh, for anybody. 
And if anybody would like to ask a question to Elsa directly, you could um, um, unmute yourself and uh, feel free to share your video to ask a question. Um, and uh, as people think about those, Jill, you can continue with any questions that you have. Sure. Um, so I guess I thought it might be useful because a lot of people haven't um, gone to Cuba or know about art training in Cuba to talk about your own training um, and how, um, how, how and when that started and what you were trained in. How did that work for you there? Right. Yes, our education there is pretty good, I have to say. I, I, I felt lucky to go to art school there. Um, it starts really early when you're 12. Um, and then you go through the vocational period, which is from 12 to about um, 15, I think. And then you go into the next level, which is uh, in the middle level. Uh, nivel medio is how we call it there. And then there is the higher education, which is the uh, Instituto Superior de Arte in Havana. Um, I don't know at this time how things are, but at the time I was there, uh, I received a really um, deep art education. Um, it's focused on many things, not only uh, techniques and medium, different materials and the way to work with them, uh, but at some point also just developing your own language and your own way of doing things um so yeah that was a great experience at the same time we didn't have a lot of resources like i was trained uh for sculpture but i, I never fired a single thing you know in the kiln because there was no none of that but i was lucky i learned a lot and um, all of those things that we learned during the art education are things that you can see in a lot of Cuban artists, like they are, um, they have really good skills with whatever they do. You know, there is a lot of work that is done in a way that you see that person is mature, you know, in working with things and there is an understanding. Um, so yeah, the teachers were really great, at least my experience. Um, we had a close relationships. They were, they took what they did seriously. Uh, we had fun. Um, there was the freedom to explore and play around and just be yourself. And so all I have are good memories from the time when I, I got my art education. Um, and what about um, art history? I mean, from studio, I can see that that was very much in depth. Did you learn art history at the same time? Yeah, 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 yeah. We had, uh, I mean, you need to um think about the fact that the the cuban art education is a mix of very classical way of teaching art and a little bit of flavor of, from the caribbean so when you mix these two things it's kind of unusual you know it's relaxed and cool but very strict you know like you know everything about art history which i think is important you know some people don't care about it and that's fine. There are many ways to to be an artist, but I personally find it really interesting just to go back and understand the way in which art has been done and also create my own opinions, you know, because not everything that is written in a book is necessarily the truth. So, but you have the option to look at it and you need to look at it, you know, just to understand like, oh, okay, well, I, I, I don't agree with this. I don't like this, but it's a fact, you know, that's how things happened or at least how things were told. Uh, but yeah, our history was very important in yeah. the process of learning, yeah. Elsa, I have a, I have a question for you. Uh, first, I just want to you know, acquiesce what you are saying about art history. History in general, as we know, is, is so important that um, for us to know those contexts and foundations and what's come before. And there's still so much educationally uh, to be mined there and things to be broken down. And also thank you for talking about creativity. Um, you know, that is one of those words that are taken for granted. And um, a lot of people think that creativity 
is something you are born with and you have it or you don't, but it takes a lot of nurturing and, you know, um, artists need to, you know, um, nurture that. Uh, my question is in regards to the curatorial practice. We have a lot of students interested um, and artists as curator. Can you talk a little bit how you got into that and how you feel as though it has uh, related to your studio practice? Yeah, well, I always say that every artist at some point should curate something because it helps you put yourself in the opposite position where you're not the center, but you're actually in function of um, facilitating someone else to communicate something. And that has been one of the most amazing experiences that I've had so far. Um, it's a continuation of my process as an artist. Like there is a point where you kind of get tired of yourself <laughs> and not in a bad way. It's like I, you want to experience also other artists at world and the way they do things. So the way we curate exhibitions at our yard is very special and very unusual because the people that participate in that process are active creators of whatever we're gonna present to the public. So the process of creating a show uh, normally starts with an idea, right? Something that you want to communicate or something you think would be great to explore and see what comes up from that. Uh, sometimes you have the artist from the beginning, sometimes you have the idea and then you find the artist. Uh, it's just like the work of an artist. It's very organic and it depends on so many factors, you know, from the outside. Uh, but there is always one single goal when we create something, which is we want people to come to that place, look at what we did and get something from that. So that when they go home, they're still thinking like, maybe I don't understand that, but there is something that I find is important from what I just saw, you know, uh, from the work of other people, from the, the whatever the concept was or the, the, the subject. Um, so it's extremely uh, satisfying to be part of that process. And also it requires uh, a, a degree of generosity where you are working in, um, in this way where you want the person who's participating to have the, the space and the conditions to show their best, uh, you know, art and whatever it is that they're going to share. Um, so in that process, you learn a lot, you know, because you need to be a good listener and you need to also honor that person and the fact that you need, you want to create a platform so they can have a voice, right? So uh, curating exhibitions has been um, a whole journey and I'm so excited about the one that I'm curating now, which is for 2022. It's a fascinating subject that actually came from a conversation between Jill uh, Carly and me <clears throat> and some uh, some things that she wanted to share with me about her daughter who studies law and then a discovery that she had about some things that were happening that were illegal um, related to the world of misdemeanor which is small crimes that don't get punished uh, in, in the regular way but and then that thing started to grow and change and it ended up being a very concrete concept that I'm developing now with a Cuban artist uh, who um, is very successful in his career. And he's going to do this as his first curatorial project. And I'm extremely excited because I told him, you need to curate this with me. And I know that you're perfect for this. And he was extremely excited. And he's actually, uh, we're meeting um, on Saturday. He's, he's living in Spain, but he's coming. Um, uh, he's in New York for work. Um, so yes, whoever is interested in curating, you don't even need to be part of any arts organization. You as a person on your own can come up with the most 
special ideas and make it happen. My recommendation is just be creative and learn to, to collaborate with people. Don't isolate yourself. Find other people, share your ideas, and see where it takes you. And Art Yard, I, just to be transparent, because I'm on the board of Art Yard too, um, and Elsa's the artistic director, is opening a new building tomorrow <laughs> or sometime really I'm soon. Proud of it. Yeah. Just fabulous. And they have a major residency program. It's a new organization, so they're feeling their way in what to do. But um, I encourage you, especially if you're an artist or a curator, to take a look at what's going on there, um, because there's a lot of new partnerships being formed and new ways of thinking about how to um, present art and connect it with the community. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I added the website to our yard uh, okay. document. So if you want to share it later uh, after this meeting is done, you'll find it there. Great. Good. Do you have other questions, Scott, or should I continue? Um, if you have questions, you'll go ahead. Yes, please. Well, I guess one of the, um, as an immigrant myself to this country, I think, and, and for you as an artist, I wonder um, what the um, benefits might be from being an outsider coming into a country, making art, finding your place there as an artist. Because um, there's been, I, you, in some ways, you know, if you're in a small island in Cuba, then a lot of your art is kind of self-referential to that. But coming to the States and some, you kind of have to leave that behind and see where your art goes. And I wonder what that process has been for you. Yeah, it has been a very um, profound process, which is something that applies not only to artists, I think that whatever big change you go through, especially moving from one country to another, requires for you to be open to learning, um, curious to understand how things work and why they work the way they work. Uh, so the main thing that I have experienced, you know, in this process of moving here has been now it's going to be 20 years, 21 years, something like that. It seems like it was yesterday. Uh, it's just a journey and it never stops. You know, from the year when I came in 2000, um, I couldn't speak the language very well. You know, it was very frustrating. And that was very difficult. You know, sometimes I wanted to go back to my apartment in Havana. Uh, but then I thought, no, I want to learn, you know, I want to force myself to, to absorb this uh, environment. And it, 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 it keeps happening, you know, to this day, you know, there are things that I'm still learning, you know, it's a constant, uh, reminder that you still don't know enough. You, you need to know more and more. And then the biggest challenge is like, how do you find your, your space, you know, in that vast world of people and, and ideas and cultures and whatever, um, it's up to you. And to me, that is art, you know, like you have to use your creativity, you know, to, to create your own, you know, whatever it is that you want to give to others, right? So it's not always about receiving and, and getting and it's about what little thing can you do for others? And that's, I think, is the best way to, to create that space that we are all looking for, regardless of where you are coming from, you know? What is it that you can contribute? And that's what drives me, you know, in this process of learning. Is in the process of learning, I'll give whatever I think I can give. And that's it. Good. I think that's. Thank you, Elsa. Um, we are not receiving any questions in the chat. Um, we have a couple more minutes if anybody at home uh, would like to drop in a question or ask Elsa directly. Um, if there are no questions, um, I let me finish by saying thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your time today.
Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to share your art and our galleries with our audiences. Jill, any final words from you? Um, just again, I'll reiterate my thanks too to Elsa. I always um, come out of our conversations with more energy and more questions. <laughs> so that's the way it should be. And I thank you for that. Well, a pleasure. Thank you so much for this invitation. I appreciate it. Good. See you soon. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.